So thanks everyone for being here. And I'm so pleased to introduce Galia Lin, um, who's an artist from Los Angeles, um, here to do a workshop with us um, on, on strength and, and vulnerability and to talk about her own work and uh, to show us some of her own work. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Gali in just a second. Um, I know, you know, especially for when we're having discussions, it would be wonderful if folks did turn their cameras on or were able to, you know, to contribute verbally. Um, so I know that Gali is really hoping to have a conversation with us as well. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, okay. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. For you guys, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Um, it's been a long morning, as we said. We had an earthquake of four 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 forty four. Um, so I want to uh, thank Anna and Erica for inviting me to do this. And um, like Anna said, when we're having discussions, it would be great if you can have your camera on. Also, towards the end of the session, we'll have a, a workshop. So if, just a reminder: if you can have. Um, paper, pens, pencils, whatever, like drawing, painting, writing material so you can use. And I mean, feel free to uh, send questions in the chat or if you wanna uh, unmute yourself or Anna, if you can unmute people if they have questions. So, um, my name is Galia Lin and I am originally from Israel and it's been thinking about this show, thinking about the stock has not been an easy journey. They brought up a lot of difficult things for me. And I know you guys have been involved or been around this show and this material for a while now. So I'd really love to hear, I'm interested in hearing the kind of impact that it had on, uh, on the students, on, you know, and whoever wants to say what it is that they brought up for them now or anytime during the conversation because i feel like this is really heavy subject matter uh so does anybody want to uh have anything to say about about the show and about this experience just curious to uh get your take on this Okay. Well, Anna, do you have something to say about that? <laughs> well, I'm going to give, I'll give them just one second to, to think over, you know, if they want to, if they want to say something. Um, or you can also, folks, if, if you have to, you can put it in the chat as well. Right. And so maybe I'll just talk a little bit about uh, my experience with it. Um, so I think with the, the, the conversion of this show, uh, the crisis we're having currently at the border, uh, the uh, Derek Chauvin trial, the uh, attacks against Asian American, reflecting on some of my own experience as a Jewish person, it's kind of, it's a conversion of, of a lot of horrible things, really. And I'm kind of struggling to figure out how to find hope in all of it, how to figure out uh, how can I make a difference? And so one of the things that I, so, so what I wanted to share today is a little bit about the history of my life, my immigration journey and my practice and how it kind of all comes together in my way of kind of dealing with, 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 with all of that that's happening. So, I mean, we can just, I'll keep on going and if anybody has anything to say or share, happy to, to do that. Um, so I am a sculptor and a site responsive installation artist. I was born and raised in Ramat Gan, which is a suburb of Tel Aviv. I live in Los Angeles. I've been here since 1991. Um, we came here during the first Gulf War. It was uh, a situation where we were being bombed every night uh, and Saddam Hussein, was bombing us every night and we didn't know if the warheads would be regular warheads or chemical warheads so you had to sit sit with a gas mask in a sealed room whenever the sirens went off and at the time we uh, were sharing a house with a family with an eight-month-old and you can't put a gas mask on an eight-month-old 
So there is this, they designed this special aquarium where you can put the gas mask, the, the, the baby in them. And obviously the baby was not happy. And so, you know, we had to kind of like rock the baby so he can calm down and talk to him. It was, it was really bad. And I think after, towards the end of that war, it was very clear to me and my boyfriend at the time that we need to leave. We needed to get out of there. Um, I was born in 1963. And since from 1963 until 1991, um, where I lived, where, where we let, when we left, I've been through and I had to, I, I have a list here. So when I was four, it was the six day war. When I was 10, it was the Yom Kippur war. When I was 15 years old, it was Operation Litani. From 19 to 21, there was a war in the, Gal in the Galilee. And uh, in 1990, and then 1991, it was the Gulf War. And so I was 27 years old and we left and it didn't stop there. So when I came here, it took 15 years to become a citizen and a lot of twists and turns, a lot of money. And I remember getting my passport, you know, getting my, we got our green card in 2001. And just before, in June, just before September, which we got lucky because all the rules changed after that. And then I got my uh, citizen, I think, 10 years later. And I remember holding my American passport and I, and I felt really good about myself, right? Oh my God, I made it through, et cetera, et cetera. But then in light of everything that's going on, in light of looking at this show, I kept thinking, wow, did I get this because of my skin tone, my skin color, because where I'm from, you know, my skin passport. And it's, it's really, humbling and a difficult question to think about you know you want to think that you earn something because you worked hard towards it but maybe you had opportunity or some unfair advantages and this show really drove it home for me so what do you do with that what do you do with these big feelings you know i i try to make a difference and so I want to kind of start talking about, um, about my practice, moving on to my practice. I am a sculptor and um, a sat responsive installation, installation artist. I am interested in the relationship between spaces, people, and objects, and how they all come together. And I believe I make vessels and I make guardians. It's and I explore the relationship between strength and vulnerability. And I will show you some guardians, multiple iterations of guardians, and I will so I will show you some vessels. And I think that vessels, humans are amazing vessels. You know, um, we're imperfect. We age. We leak. We break. We die. And like my vessels. We're much stronger than what we appear. We're fragile and strong. And the more fractured we are, all the, the scars, the, the, the nooks and crannies, it's the story of our life. It's what makes us interesting. It's this journey and, and accepting it, accepting our imperfection, accepting our mortality creates calmness, I believe, and gives you strength. Because when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, you're not weak, you're strong. At least to me, that's what it means. And um, yeah, so um, I think maybe we share the video uh, of my show that I just did just close to give you a little bit more insight, and then we'll do a walkthrough in the studio. Hi, I'm Galia Lin. Welcome to Beauty Queen, Heartbreaker, High Maintenance at Track 16 Gallery. 
Track 16 Gallery is on the 10th floor at the Bendix Building, downtown Los Angeles. Developer Florence Kessler, who in the 1920s stood out in the male-dominated commercial real estate business, put together an empire that came to include at least 10 downtown buildings worth an estimated $7 million in 1926. The Bendix was her last development before the stock market crash and the Great Depression hit. Today, it is home to fashion businesses, artist studios, galleries, and dance studios. Over the past 25 years, I have been obsessed over Neolithic cultures. The architecture, objects, images are very compelling to me. Perhaps because those cities, home to as many as 5,000 to 7,000 inhabitants at a time, were proto cities. Meaning, as the ruins are showing, there was no hierarchy, all buildings are equal. There was no separation between life and death. Bones of ancestors were brought into living quarters and buried inside the home. And lastly, evidence has shown that men and women were treated with equality. In 2020, I was planning a trip to visit some of these sites, but all these travel plans were scrapped. So I began reclaiming these rituals and making them in a way that was empowering to me. This show is a result of decades of research into a more equal society and reclaiming rejection. The name of the show, Beauty Queen, Heartbreaker, High Maintenance, came from the three pinks I used throughout the show. The paints are from Home Depot and they are regular house paints. As you enter the gallery, you encounter a mezuzah. A mezuzah is an object that hangs in the doorway of Jewish households. It is a small vessel that holds a scroll with a prayer. I always assume a mezuzah was a guardian, a symbol that represents a relationship between people and God in which he promises to protect the home. As I was reading the prayer hidden inside the mezuzah, I discovered it is a command and a threat. It is a command to love God and a threat that if you don't, then you and everyone in the household will suffer. I was wondering, can you really command someone to love you? My mezuzah is a guardian. It is large and pink. Nothing is hidden, and it offers a connection to joy. I have always been interested in a relationship between spaces, objects, people, and rituals. Over the past 15 years, I've created multiple places, both permanent and temporary. This past year, I gave myself permission to create such a place for myself. At the center of the installation is Womb Tomb. Every now and then, I get an urge to crawl into a corner and disappear. This past year, this urge came on very frequently. So I created Womb Tomb in response to this feeling. There are six stones placed in a circle. I often work in groups of six. Many cultures have relationships with the number six. Six is considered the most harmonious of all single digit numbers. The most important influence of the six is its loving and caring nature. Properly nicknamed the motherhood number, it is all about sacrificing, caring, healing, protecting, and teaching others. And so, I had this stone in the studio for many years. There was something about its shape that I found beautiful. I have been making large stone guardians like the ones that are in the show for a while, and I was ready to explore other shapes and sizes. I wrapped the stone with clay. Once the clay set a little, I cut it open and reconnected it to make it whole again then fired and glazed multiple times. I considered these tapestries as a self-portrait. These drapes were hanging in my bathroom and bedroom for over 12 years. I took them down so I could take them to the dry cleaning, and he told me that there's a chance they will fall apart because they are old. I took a second look realizing that they have witnessed my life and hold all those memories. Why would I want to erase it all? I make vessels and guardians, exploring their relationship between strength and vulnerability. For this new body of work, I use new bodies of clay, glazes, and firing techniques, stretching size, temperature, and glazing so that I can create a conversation between clay, organic glazes, and metallic ones. When I was building mezuzah and wumtum, I realized that I will need to paint them vertically, which would be a new thing for me, because when I sketch and paint, I do it horizontally. So I collected the plywood pieces I had in the studio, covered them in stucco and began painting. I was completely absorbed in the viscosity, smell and vibrancy of the paint. It felt like a moment of channeling what was outside myself into the form of a guardian or a totem. 
Over the years, I have accumulated small stones from multiple firings, stones that have broken off from large pieces. I kept them all. This past year, they became precious objects to be wrapped and protected. These building blocks were created as glaze samples. I have begun exploring new glazes and needed to do some samples on different clay bodies, firing schedules, and temperature. Normally, glaze samples are done on a tile, but I don't do 2D objects, so I wanted to see what the glaze would look like on a 3D body. There are 36 building blocks, 2 times 18. In the Jewish alphabet, every letter has a number. The number 18 makes the word chai, which means alive. It is customary to give multiple of 18 for life celebrations. These works are a part of an offering in which one third of the funds will go towards supporting Arts at Blue Roof, a newly launched nonprofit in District 9 in South LA. More specifically, funds will support a room of one's own, an artist residency for women and women identified artists of all disciplines. The residency will provide a studio, stipend, exhibition space, and a mentorship network. Thank you for joining me on a video tour of Beauty Queen, Heartbreaker, High Maintenance, the Track 16 Gallery. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I thought what I'd like to do now is um, take a little tour of the studio. And then after that, we can do our, our workshop. That sounds okay? Okay, so now I need, I need to switch devices. So <laughs> I'm going to mute this. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. So now I need to change camera. Oh, we did it, cool, all right. So this is my studio. My studio was, uh, is located in the sanctuary of an abandoned uh, church in South LA. And we, in 2016, we, I created an art hub that has uh, 10 artist studios, full kitchen, um, a project room, and a, a large parking lot. And we have done multiple events with the artists, with the community, kind of trying to bring people together through art. So what I'd like to, this, I'm just turning this video off because it's confusing me. Here we go. All right. So what I'm going about to show you is several guardians. I work uh, with clay a lot. Clay is the beginning and the end for me. I sometimes use other materials. Uh, but I kind of like understand the world through clay. So you see uh, six guardians. I was relating, I was talking about the number, my relationship to number six before. These six guardians were installed um, in multiple locations. Last time uh, they were in uh, Descanso Gardens outside of uh, Pasadena, I think. And you could see the dirt, still the dirt that came in the garden. I didn't. Uh, rinsed it all because I kind of like it. I, I think one of the reasons why I kind of pull these guardians out is because I kind of needed a, a sacred space, a safe place when dealing with some of the heaviness that the show brought up. And they are made from paper clay and they're glazed and obviously they can go outside. And if you, ha if you have any questions about what you're seeing, technique, whatever, just let me know. Paper clay is a clay that has a lot of paper and it's mixed. It's not designed to work large, which is why I really like it because I like to stretch the material. And on, you see it gives these magnificent cracks. The pieces are all structurally sound, but they seem fragile, right? And I experiment with different temperature and different firing technique, reduction or oxidation. And I can talk about a little bit more about the oxidation is when you flood the kiln with uh, oxygen and reduction is when you reduce it. And so it changes the color of the clay and the glaze. I want to show you one more guardian. This one was in the show.
So this one had multiple firing because if you see, this is shiny, this is low fire glaze. And over here, there's like four different kinds of glazes on top to almost like watercolors kind of merging together. Um, it's hard for me to read the chat on the phone. So if there's, um, Anna, if there's any question or comment, do you mind reading it? Uh, sure. It, uh, Brennan just wrote that they were going to ask you about the, the cracks in the structure, but you, but you answered it already. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this, I, my background is in architecture. I didn't go to art school. And so I am very much interested in the integrity of the structure. And since these guys, they, they can go outside and they're very, it's stoneware basically, because I use them all in high fire. This one was a year, the stone was installed for a year at the Craft Contemporary outside in the courtyard. So you see it's you know, nothing, it doesn't fade, it doesn't, it's, like, it's, it's stone. That's why it's called stone. Right. That's amazing. I don't know like much about uh, pottery, ceramics, sculpture. So just it's amazing that you were able to create these structures and completely out of my realm of imagination <laughs> uh, to be able to make them like look like this and still be perfectly structurally sound and whatnot. Oh, thank you. It's um, it's a very physical um, job. And I think I like that, you know, because when you get to your whole body is involved in the making and you notice this, I like to mix and blend glazes and I kind of let the glaze do its thing. So there's a chemical reaction that happens and the kiln is my partner in making the work. It does certain things, you know, I can program it to do what I want it to do, but it will, it has a mind of its own. Also clay has a memory too. This is an example of an earlier vessel. This glaze is called, it's a crawl glaze. And that's what it does. It crawls on the body of the clay. And I don't know if you can see, do you see the green and blue in there? So a little bit, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if, I don't remember if it's a gin bottle or a vodka bottle that I basically, let me see from here. I basically broke and put it in there. Oh, we need a light in there. Anyway, that's that. And then we have one more smaller kind of vessel that you could see. So, yeah, that's... Well, yeah, can, you can you tell us a little bit about the objects that are with that last vessel that you showed us? Are those objects there for a particular reason or...? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, I think of my work as an uh, object of ritual, something that you... Thought, relics, rather. Relics that you would find in an excavation. And, you know, just like... You don't know when you find stuff in an excavation, you don't always know what it was made for. It, so there's always this sense of something familiar, but humans made, made it, right? So there's always some, something that is uh, familiar, but un un unrecognizable at the same time. And so I've been making, I notice I've been making myself little temples in, in the studio based on this new body of work that we're gonna cover next session. I found my husband's baby diary. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Can you see? And I have another, um, I made another little temple here of objects. They just, they just bring me comfort. You know, it's because this sub this subject matter is not easy. So I have to find ways to. Oh, look at this one. This is like this is a fifty-year-old children's book, right? I have to find um, 
something that gives me comfort and centers me so I can continue to navigate in the world. Okay, so I think that we'll move on to our, to our workshops, right? I will change devices. This, I mean, I mean, I mean, oops, oops, you, come on, come on. Oh. Right. I was just wondering if anybody has any questions or. Okay. So I we actually have one, sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead. So for the one in six, how did you get it to like be very thin on the top and then like very thick at the bottom because I'm working with clay right now, and so I'm okay. like, very curious. So, um, are you throwing or are you hand building? I'm hand building, so I'm like very curious. Okay, so uh, the way I build my pieces, I uh, take a bag of clay, 25 pound of clay, and I pound it until it's flat, that's my base, and then I take the but the bag of clay, cut it to four, make large coils. So my base usually, I mean, it depends how big the piece is, but about this size is those coils, which are really thick. You can imagine, right? So I, several bags. And then I start building other thinner coils or slab. That makes sense? And I think also, uh, it depends also how much control you have if you want to build it around a mold or if you hand free. I don't know, you're hand freeing or building it around a mold? Uh, it's a little bit of both for me, both. for my class right now. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, and then the trick is also getting it so it's not wet completely. You know, so you, can, you have to build it in stages. You build it, you let it set for a day, just cover the top. It depends also on the time of, time of, time of year, you know, uh, when mm. how much humidity is in the air. And so you let it um, slightly set and then you build because if it's too wet, it'll collapse. You know that, right? Yeah. yeah. I think for me, the, the thing with building with clay is really thinking about it as a partnership. I, I, for me, I don't try to force, it's like my way. I have a very loose idea of what is going to happen, but I really let the clay and my body kind of like take it to where it needs to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think of it really as a partnership. Okay. Um, Shall we move on to our uh, workshop? Okay. Hey, um, Galia, can I just ask one more question of you? Yes, of course. Um, because one, so I was wondering something that's sort of occurring to me as I'm looking at your work is um, sort of like imagery around femininity. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit, I, I don't really have a particular question, but you could talk maybe a little bit of, about like, um, is there kind of a, a uh, d does womanhood or femininity have a play a role in the in the work that you're that you're making? That's a really good question. Someone said that my work is genderless, but I think I like it better when we say it's feminine and masculine. Um, especially when you look at the show, the video of the show that, I, that we just shared, an art critic wrote that she said, and I need to write it down, uh, that the uh, shapes are aggressively masculine with f fiercely uh, painted in fierce, fiercely feminine colors, right? I think, you know, when I first started, I, I, became an artist later in life. Um, 
I, you know, my, I grew up in Israel. My dad was a bus driver. My mom was a homemaker. Didn't, there was no relationship to art. I didn't go to uh, galleries, museums. I didn't know it was a thing. And um, so when I started making art and kind of entering the art world, I was told, well, you have to really watch out. You don't want to be labeled like a feminist artist or a this artist, you know what I mean? Because that's kind of, and the thing is, I am a woman. I can't help being a woman, you know? And I think that there are issues, there are a lot of issues that I care about. And, and, and I think it comes through in the work from a place of getting to balance and equality. I think that's really interests me. So I think that there's, I'd like to think that there's both strong feminine and strong masculine in the work. And maybe we're not used to that kind of balance, you know, in, 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 in the world, in art world. So did I answer your question? Definitely, thanks. <laughs> okay, so if there, if there are any uh, other questions, I guess we'll just move on to our little, um, so usually what I do when I have shows, I do a guardian workshop and we all get together in one room, there's clay involved. And then we kind of do a little session about reflecting on strength and vulnerability, but obviously we can't, this is not something we can do here. So if you're into it, we're just going to do a little, something a little different um, this time around. So if you can make sure you have your, your pens and, and great and papers and whatever you need. Um, and I want to start with uh, a quote by Anne Truitt, who's a sculptor. And she said that vulnerability is the guardian of integrity. And let's just, sit with that for a minute. What I'm going to do, um, I have some music. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to write, write the music for the first five minutes. We're going to do a little meditation on strength and vulnerability. And then we're going to take five minutes and we're going to draw or write or whatever comes to our mind um, through that. So I've never done this before. Hopefully it would work. And I'm going to share my screen. Share sound. Okay. So I'm going to start playing the music. And I'm hoping you can hear me and the music. So let's take a deep breath. Close our eyes. That breath out. Let's do it again. Take it in and then hold for five. And then let it out. Do it a couple more times. Your own rhythm. Take a breath in. Hold for five beats. five beats on the bottom. And we're gonna just try to slow our body and our mind. It's okay if thoughts and feelings are kind of running around. Just notice them. There's something this is something I do a lot in my practice. I become overwhelmed and I can't find my center. And then let's think about a time in your life where you felt really strong really joyful Just after maybe accomplishing something that was difficult or challenging 
So when you think about this moment, Maybe some difficult things will come up. It's okay. It's uncomfortable. But maybe you can just stay with that uncomfortableness. Just notice it and accept it. And don't be attached to it. It's just it's like a, a wave that, that comes and goes. So think about this moment of strength, of joy, of accomplishing something special. And think about, try to remember what time of year it was. Was it winter? Was it summer? Was it spring? What time of day was it? Was it morning or evening or during the day? shining just take yourself to that moment what were you wearing was there any particular sounds or smells around you try to um, put yourself in that in that place and try to connect with that sense of strength, that strength of joy. And maybe it was just jumping really high, or maybe it was jumping in the puddle, or maybe it's getting a really good grade, or maybe it's, I don't know, Whatever that thing may be, just put yourself in that place. Feel it. Take it in and hold on to it. In a few seconds, we're going to hear a bell. And then we're going to open our eyes and start drawing and sketching whatever comes to your mind with no judgment. Open your eyes and let's uh, and draw and write. We're gonna take five minutes and we're gonna do that.
Welcome back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the headset trauma. Okay. I, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. So, all right. Um, so what I would love is to see what came up. If anyone is interesting, interested in sharing, I would, um, I would love to see. I'll go. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, let's switch over. So this is what I drew. It's, you tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit. About so it. it's kind of like me in my happy state, which is most like, which is mostly dreaming. And then I just relate some of my favorite parts of memory, which is like going to the beach, being outside, hiking, me, this is right here, like first time me winning an art prize. It was for third place and like enjoying my favorite meals with family and et cetera. Oh. That's wonderful. Does anyone else want to share theirs? You can also turn your yeah. mic on and just describe what it is that you did. Um, that also works. Um. For mine, um, I, I drew a couple moments of uh, being on stage. Um, I haven't really been acting recently because uh, of certain circumstances and COVID and everything, um, but I, I really like to act and acting makes me really happy and especially being on stage and like, not necessarily only like the acting part, but like the audience enjoying it and then like clapping at the end and just knowing that they had a good time. Um, Thanks, Nico. Does anyone else want to share this? I know it can be a little intimidating. OK, we have a note. Brennan, I also found myself overthinking it. Um, I actually had two and, and I was like, I don't know how to decide. And then I ended up just going with one of them, but I know, I know exactly what you feel like. <laughs> so what does it mean to overthink something in this, in this context? I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know. Brennan, can you explain maybe? <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, In that case, I was like, I had, one thing came to mind for me, and then and I and then like one thing came to mind, and then another thing came to mind, and they were so different in many ways, and I. And I was really struck. I was, it was amazing the way that they just came into my mind, these two things, um, as we were thinking about it. And they are, they're, they are both, um, both kind of a kinds of births. Um, one was when I gave birth to my daughter, um, uh, now 16 and a half years ago. And, um, and just, you know, feeling so, so strong at that moment. So, so, you know, so miserable, exhausted and in pain and just like miserable. I've been in, in labor for 30 hours. Um, but also feeling like really just so, so strong. So, so like, like I could do anything. Um, and then the other one was when, you know, I defended my dissertation. So that's like another kind of birth, right? Giving birth to this dissertation, which is like a book, you know, um, and then you defend it in front of your peers. And it's an amazing, 
moment, right? Um, and just getting to the other side of that after being in grad school for seven years. And, you know, it just was, both of them were really amazing. But I ended up, I, I'm not really an artist, so I wrote about, I wrote about the birth of my, my daughter, but um, I, uh, well, yes. Well, we'll talk about this statement, I'm not really an artist in the next session. <laughs> uh, what is creativity? What I, wasn't about, I wasn't gonna draw myself giving birth. Let's just say that. I was like, okay. what would I draw? <laughs> <laughs> I have the things I can draw. Like I could draw a really nice looking dog. Like I have things I can draw just fine. <laughs> maybe that's, that's... you could have done a mom dog and a baby pup. Yeah, maybe I should. <laughs> um, you know, when I do these, the, this, this concept is, for me is to remind myself, you know, you know, the demons that kind of tell you that you're no good and you shouldn't even try and why bother? I don't know if you all have any of those, but mine, they come out in troves and have parties. And so I learned over the years is to invite them in, make them, invite them to lunch, make them a part of the process, acknowledge their existence. And so then when thoughts come and go, I just let them come and go and I observe. There's a beautiful Zen poem that says, uh, hopefully I won't butcher it. Uh, the coming and going of the waves, the non-coming and non-going of the water. Waves come and go, the water is always there. It took me a long time to figure out that's what it meant. You know, so I think with these, these, these thoughts, they're not our enemies or, or feelings. They're not our enemies. They're just trying to tell us something and you just, they're part of you. So what I did is I drew a box. And I basically, you remember how I talked about in the beginning of the conversation, how this brought a lot of uncomfortable feelings, which kind of pulled them out. And so you can, the right the other the other way around. And so basically what I said here is you can come out, all those things that I have not allowed myself to connect with, I'm inviting them to come out because they're a part. And I'm telling them that you're a part of me, right? And I'm saying, I'm not afraid anymore. Although I am kind of afraid, but I'm like, you know. And I think something that I've been meditating a lot recently is the idea of kindness and forgiveness. And, you know, I try to bring, bring that in because I'm imperfect. I'm perfectly imperfect. And if I get overwhelmed, if things are too much, I just try to kind of reconnect with kindness and, and forgive myself for getting to that state of anxiety to begin with. Because if you stay with that state of anxiety, you kind of perpetuate it. So when I do these exercises, the idea is to connect to a place where we were able to do that, where we felt really good, and almost like bottle it and carry it with us. So when next time when we feel uh, not so good, we can open the bottle, we're gonna take a whiff of it, or drink it or whatever. <laughs> I know it sounds very granola eating, tree hugging, and you know, um, maybe a little bit of that, but I'm mostly red wine drinking, steak eating, used to ro ride a motorcycle kind of person, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, does anybody else? I would really love to hear from other people who haven't shared what this brought up for them. I think Delano or Julia, do you want to say anything? Um, I really have too much to add because I was kind of like overthinking the whole thing. So I didn't really know what to what to draw. That way, kind of sum up everything. Well, can you share one thing maybe that came up or one thought that you had? 
Um, I guess one thought that came up was kind of like, uh, just like some of like the positive experiences that happened in high school that I kind of, I kind of miss. That's kind of like different now that I'm in college. I guess that's, that kind of came up. I'm sorry, what kind of experience? The, uh, my high school experience is like my, like some like the positive aspects of high school. Like I kind of missed, that came, kind of popped up. Yeah. Do you find you miss those, though you miss high school or those kinds of positive experiences a lot? Uh, just certain aspects of it, not like I, high school as a whole, just mm -hmm. like those couple of moments in it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Thanks. I think that uh, experiences that are mixed that have difficulties and challenge and then also joy and, and happiness, I think those have the most impact on us. This is what we remember the most. Because if everything is going along, it is not, it does not, it doesn't resonate, it doesn't stay. Do you think that has something to do with the connection between, like we were talking about, you were talking about before, but between strength and vulnerability, like that you, that any, any moment, anything, any and mo vulnerability. Sorry, you froze. Can you repeat that, please? No. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. No, I was thinking about the connection between strength and vulnerability and how any moment of strength is also a moment in which there is vulnerability there as well. And, um, yeah, I was thinking about that when I was thinking about my own, my own, you know, meditation. I was thinking about how these these are that when we're moments of strength are moments in which we are also sort of processing our own and coming to terms with our own vulnerability at those very same moments and requiring us to embrace that as well. I, I agree a hundred percent. I think when giving birth is a very vulnerable place but also very strong yeah 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 i think especially now kind of going circle circle back to what we talked about in the beginning conversation with the climate and with this show i mean have i have any of the uh, have any of the uh, students seen the show in person we're not allowed in the gallery we're not allowed and okay. then of course now the, the college is uh, students are all going home um, not, You've been immersed immersed in it for a while, right? In in the subject matter, in different to different degrees, the students have mm -hmm. in this in this group. Yeah. I think it's so important when you because it's so it's such a difficult subject matter to kind of find our own light and our own strength, so we can. Uh, try to figure out how to make us, even if it's a small positive change in the world. I mean, to me, even having these discussions, having this show as difficult as it is, and having these conversations is a sign of hope and progress. I agree. Julia, do you want to share yours? You're the only one who hasn't. That's okay. <laughs> I talked about giving birth. Come on now. I talked about my demons. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any more questions? Any other questions about the work or my process? I, I, I kind of let you guys into my process, really. <laughs> of making the work and... Do you use meditation in your process? I, you know, for the longest time, I thought of the work itself as my meditation because it's very meditative, it's repetitive, and I like to work on several pieces at the same time so I can get to a place where my, and they're big, so they're very physical, so I'm really tired, I'm exhausted physically, so you kind of remove yourself from the process and you let your body just do what it needs to do. This past year, I felt like that was not enough. And I actually started to meditate like every day for 20 minutes. And 
it's really helped me a lot because it's been overwhelming. It's been challenging to find the center and to find the light. So yeah, I, I have been Former, I have been unformally meditating for decades just because I, when I do the work, I'm like completely there, but kind of formally in the last year. Yeah. And, and when I do that, sometimes stuff comes up and I try not to judge, I not judge myself. You know, the thoughts come and go. I'm not, it's not like, oh, I need to be concentrated on the breathing or whatever. Whatever comes up, I honor it and I let it go by. I notice it and I let it go by. It feels good. Yeah.